Welcome to Digging History. I'm your host, James McCormick, and Corbett Perkins here. And our show is about veterans that go out digging our way into history and using our love for history as part of our therapy as we navigate life after the military. This show is all about bringing together veterans, history, and the love of relic hunting to tell the story of those who served long ago. This show will tell the history of America and West Virginia particularly and locate those precious artifacts and properly display and preserve them for the sake of history. We bring together technology including metal detectors, maps, and even drone technology needed to locate, film, and document these discoveries, allowing all citizens to see and in some cases touch items that are in many cases older than the state of West Virginia. The veterans we work with on these projects will have an opportunity to tell their own story and in the course of these expeditions find some therapeutic value of the experience and fellowship that these great adventures provide. Today's show will focus on teaching our children history and taking them on some of our adventures where they actually got a chance to find some really cool relics. So sit back and enjoy the show and remember folks that under the current COVID-19 situation we must all do our part to social distance, wear proper PPE, and maintain good hygiene practices so that we not only protect ourselves, but also other citizens of our great state and nation. Now, I want to focus your attention to some artifacts that I brought in today. And I want to discuss them with you and also uh, may even get you to help me to identify a couple of these. So the first one that I want to talk about is some of the bullets that we have here. And if we can just get our close up on this section. Now, these, we find a lot of these uh, out and about. And, and these are called canister rounds. Basically, what happened was is you had cannonballs that were filled with all of these bullets. A modern, or an old, an old claymore. Yeah, basically like an old claymore mine. And this would blow up over the troops and just shatter literally hundreds of these little balls down on top of the troops along with the shrapnel of the iron from the cannonball. Those we find, and a lot of people mistake them for bullets. Technically, they are bullets, uh, but the reality is, is that they were packed into these canister rounds and they had a significant impact on the troops. I want to focus on some of the other bullets. If you see here in the front, I have three bullets that are lined up together. Now, I have another bullet here. It's a 69 caliber, but I cannot get it to stand up because it's so big and it's been fired. But the reason why I wanted to show you this was to show you the different sizes and the ranges of bullets that you'll find on Civil War battlefields. For instance, the most common round that we find is a 58 caliber three ring bullet. And as you can tell by the size, it's just a little bit bigger than this 45 caliber bullet that was most likely handmade by one of the troops in the camp. Then if you follow on over here, you'll find a 44 caliber bullet. This 44 caliber bullet could have been seen in the old Henry type rifles, pistols, and a lot of other different weaponry that was on the battlefield. We also find round balls. Now, how you can identify that this is actually a bullet and not a canister round is because you can see the marking where this was poured and this was cut and shape. Now this is obviously a fired round ball and uh, it's a common find on the battlefield. Now I want to show you a couple of really cool bullets that we found and I want to tell you a little bit about them. The first one that I found, I found just the other day and if you look real close at the end of this bullet, now when you look at that you think, okay, that looks like a hollow tipped bullet like we deer hunt with. <laughs> well that's not what it is. This bullet was stuck in a rifle. And that rifle, there we go. You looking at the, oh yeah, the yeah, difference. Yeah. So if you look at the two bullets, this one right here is one that was dropped 
or fired. And this is one that was pulled. So in the Civil War, if you had loaded your weapon, there was only two ways to get that bullet out. Either fire it out or take what a, a thing called a worm, which was like a little screw, and screw it in the top of the bullet and then pull that bullet out. Looks like a wine cork. And it looks exactly like a wine cork, like you were saying. But that's the most coolest and profound pulled bullet that I have ever found in the last three years that I've been relic hunting. It could have got stuck in the guy's barrel too, mm -hmm. or his powder got wet or something while he's rifling it. And he had to get it out of there somehow. Now this one was found <clears throat> near the Battle of Barbersville. So as Corbett was saying, it could have been that case or it could have been when the, the retreat or the surrender flag went up and they said, okay, the battle's over. So sometime later during that day, they were sitting around and uh, the campfire and they unloaded their weapons. Now, let me show you this other fired 58 caliber. Check that out, Corbett. Now, if you look over there real close, and Corbett, hold that up there and show them, that fired 58 caliber bullet Maybe. is Maybe. absolutely a chunk of lead. And literally thousands of those were flying through the air at any one given time. As a matter of fact, there have been times when we have found bullets that literally struck each other in the air. And you can see or you find them laying on the ground and they are mashed together. When you find something like that, that is amazing. I have a round ball, like, well, it's not exactly like this one, but it was fired and it got, mm -hmm. did I show it to you? It got stuck in that limestone rock. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it, it's still in the limestone rock. I, I didn't fool with it. I just. I didn't even clean the bullet off or anything. I just put it in some uh, cotton and laid it down right nice so it don't fall off that limestone. Now let's take a look at this bullet right here. Now this is an early war bullet, 69 what? caliber. Wouldn't want to get hit with that. It's a huge <laughs> bullet. What we look at these, when we look at these bullets, we look for the character in each one of those. Each one of these were touched by someone years ago. Now, this bullet was heavily ramrodded, and if you look, you can see that it almost has a bursting appearance and a discoloration around the bullet. There was a common practice that sharpshooters used back during the Civil War to be able to reach targets that were far out. So what they did is they did a double load. So they would load the powder charge for one bullet, and they would generally drop that bullet either into their pocket or onto the ground. And then they would load a standard bullet. So therefore, you would have twice the powder. And they would really ram these bullets home hard. And you also run mm -hmm. the risk of that thing blowing up in your face. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. There are, there are definitely stories of sharpshooters that were hitting targets at nearly a thousand yards out. We don't find very many of those. The 69 fact, calibers like that? I'm talking about double loaded. The double That's loaded the are just amazing. So uh, and that came from the Battle of Hurricane Creek. So as you can see, we have found all these not that long ago. A couple of other artifacts that you've got here, and, and this is the one I'm gonna need help identifying is this one. Well, the pharaohs were down there in Point Pleasant area, Mason County. <laughs> the pharaoh must have dropped that. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell a story about that. But <laughs> this one right here, if you can get in a little bit closer on this, it says, remember the porter. All right, let me get that turned up. What's that H9H? Well, all I could find in reference to this was referencing a Shakespeare play. Hmm. So my theory, it's just my theory, is that this went on the end of a watch fob and that this probably was someone who was an actor that kept this in their pocket and they had their watch tied off to it. Um, those were hmm. very common back in the day and may have been someone that actually performed. I found that in a park actually in Gallipolis, Ohio. And I found that about three months ago, 
and uh, it's just had me so intrigued since. So if anyone knows anything about that tag, let me know. The next thing that I wanna talk about is the scarab. Now, when you look at this, I dug this out, I thought it was a toy. A dung beetle. <laughs> and it's a dung beetle, it's a scarab, you're right. Uh, very popular when they found the uh, King Tut's tomb. So we're talking, you know, anywhere from the late 1800s to the early 1900s into the 1920s, this was popular jewelry of the time. So I realized it was jewelry as I cleaned it up and I looked in there and you can see where there was a connector right there where there used to be a pin that went over. And some lady, probably a hundred years ago, dropped this in that same part. And it was ironically very close to where I found the watch fob. So mm. you can make up all kinds of stories you know, about that. I got that. one for you, <laughs> but that's, that's uh, rated R. We can't do that right now. So <laughs> Corbett now, he has uh, a little bit of history we want to talk about, about the Confederate flags. Now, look, I know people get real excited about the Confederate flags. We are here to talk about the history of these flags. It is history and nothing more. That's it. And I'm going to say this right now. I don't get political. I don't want to get political with anybody because mm -hmm. I will hurt your feelings. <laughs> Number two, it's all about the history, not hate. And That's it's heritage it. for most of us. I have family members that fought on both sides, Union and Confederacy. I know James has Union. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure he's got Confederacy too. And if you dig into your genealogy as well, you'll probably find out that you also have family members who were part of the Confederacy. It wasn't always about slaves. So now, if anybody's got any questions, because I'm going to do this right quick, anybody got any other questions, feel free to contact me or James, email us, hit us up on the Facebook channel mm -hmm. or page, whatever. All right. And the very first just, one. Just hold it out there. there I'm just go. going to do the star part. Uh, they're going to they're going to put pictures up with these to let you guys actually see them. As you can see, it's kind of like Betsy Ross. Oop, there we go. There's seven stars. This is the very first flag of the Confederacy. There's two other ones other than this one that I have not found yet uh, in the in the cotton. Uh, you got seven stars, eleven stars, thirteen stars. That, it all went for this succession of uh, parting with the Union. But as you can tell, it's red, red, big red stripe, big white stripe, big red stripe. The Confederacy did not want to abandon the colors of the United States. So let's just keep that in mind. So now, they pretty much kept <clears throat> everything red, white, and blue. Exactly. And okay. it's kind of like a Betsy Ross thing. Uh, you got 7, 11, 13. Um, the 13, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, the last state to succeed was Texas. So they got the big star in the middle. Yeah, the secession, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now this in here, this is the second Confederate flag, as you can tell, but it's solid white. This here is actually called the, the Cross of St. George, okay? There's 13 stars. If you look at um, Scottish flags, mm -hmm. you'll have the Cross of St. George. All right. They didn't use this one very long. As you can tell, it's solid white. And you see that bad boy on the battlefield? You don't know whether you're going or you're retreating. So they came up with the third one. The only difference is it has a big red big red end to it, a tail. And this one, you'll see it has the same amount of stars, just almost exactly identical to the very first one. That one there is actually the flag of the Army of Northern Virginia, Robert E. Lee's flag. Man, now the one that everybody gets wound up about. Mm -hmm. Individuals want to throw a big old fit about. This here, your classic stars and bars, okay? Same as the ones with the white on it, 
Same That's a Navy with, Jack, isn't it? That is actually mm -hmm. a Naval Jack. So everybody, all these Confederate flags that you guys see flying around on the back of these redneck trucks hmm. is the not the flag, Confederate it? flag. It's a Naval yeah. Jack. It flew on the Confederate boats. And how many boats did they have? I don't really know. I know they had uh, that ironclad. Yeah. And he got sank. So well, they had they, they had they had a flag similar to that on the battlefield that had a white trim around it. Exactly. So um, the actual Confederate battle flag, which I'll show that to you guys on the next months, because uh, it hasn't came in yet. There was three different sizes, mm -hmm. uh, twenty-eight inches, and it's a square with a white border. This is for every one of them. The artillery was uh, twenty-some inches. The, so it was a size comparison yeah, to Yeah, and so, the cavalry, yeah. and it's a perfect, it's just, it's just this part mm -hmm. with a white border around it. Mm -hmm. The cavalry was 38 inches square, and the, arti or the infantry was 52 or 54 square. That way the troops could see it moving forward. But the, everything, the stars and bars that everybody's throwing a fit about is a naval jack. And they didn't have very many boats because they were broke. I mean, well, so there's let's. Your, there's your quick history lesson on your Confederacy's flags. Well, folks, let's get out to the field and let you check out some of the cool things that we found with digging history. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are out for another adventure uh, at digging history and extreme Appalachian discoveries. And we have got the whole team out here. Got myself, we got Byron, we got Perkins. Oh, we're missing Clint. Yeah, we're missing one. Well, Clint's not here. But we happen to have uh, some new detectorists down here. Jacob Kessling, who I served with in the United States Army, was in Iraq with me, who is also later became a chaplain, yep. correct? And uh, his son, Gage. And that's my son, Preston. And so Preston hasn't had a chance to be on here, but they are set up and I want to kind of go by and uh, take a look at their equipment. Let's start here with Preston right here on the right. Preston's got a F2 metal detector. Uh, it's made by Fisher. He has got the sniper coil on the end, which uh, it's, it's really good for brushy areas and to kind of uh, get yourself into that area, uh, which is thick. Got his shovel, got his rig, got his gear, and got a real nice pinpointer right here. Gage has got a bounty hunter. Now, look, this is where we're talking about, folks. You don't have to go out and invest tons of money, but I promise you that Gage is gonna find some Civil War artifacts today. Look, this, this bounty hunter is a, a little bit different. Obviously, it doesn't have the digital, but you don't need that. What you need is a, something that will pick up artifacts and then we turn the sensitivity we can adjust it it's so easy to do let's not get make it complicated he's got his pinpointer he's got his rig and his gear set up boots you know we've all got boots on we've all got gloves either we've got them on or we've got them in our pocket and we're ready now jacob has just bought a Fisher F-75, a beautiful, beautiful weapon. <laughs> I love it. This is my, uh, this is my detector of choice. Obviously, you can see it's brand new. We're going to get it really dirty today, which is going to be good. Uh, you can see where he started off when you rig it up. Understand when you start to wrap that around, make sure you wrap it around and over. A lot of people make the mistake and go under like this and they get a lot of false signals because of that, simply because they don't have the coil connected with the cable going over top of the extension arm. Very simple uh, mechanics uh, to this arm rest. He's got a pinpointer, which is a F pulse pinpointer made uh, and sold actually with the machine. Um, they've got uh, an uh, army entrenching tool. We got a little garden spade right there, uh -oh. as you can see right there. Uh oh, James. Uh -oh. Brand new. Mine's under, but I don't get false readings. Because <laughs> my, mine's a Garrett. Uh -huh. I, don't uh -huh. fool with Fisher. I don't fool with Fisher. Listen to him. That came with mine. 
So, and, and he's got a real nice digging tool. And I understand that, that I have a couple of these as well. I like these because, you know, you've got a little bit of serrated edge where you can cut through roots and you're gonna run into a lot of roots out here. I came with okay. this with the, in the package. Yeah. All right, we ready to go, guys? Yeah. Let's get a thumbs up. Preston? <laughs> I'll drop my shovel. All right, all right, let's go, guys. Listen, we have something that we always say here. You can't find anything sitting, sitting on, on the, the couch. couch. <laughs> Let us go, man. We will find something good today. Okay, we're out here on the search. Hit this area right here real good. So while we're out here metal detecting, we're actually taking these kids out and trying to show them something. You know, teach you a little bit about history, Preston's found some nails and and different things so far. All right, we got something over. Come on. This is probably a bullet. Right there. So that's definitely a signal to dig. Yeah, that's a signal to dig. So we know that. Now, Preston, if you want to, and you want to help Gage, once he digs that dirt, dirt out, then you can show him, you can use your uh, pin pointer. Yeah, it's right, right there, in there. Right about the center of there. Let's see. Right there. Yep, that's it. All right. So we're gonna sit here, we're gonna see what he digs up. Come on over here, Preston. All right, there you go, just flip it over. Now take your pin pointer and check it out and see what you got there. Okay, gotta go down just a little bit deeper. All right. Come over here. And uh, catch this spot right here you, so you don't... Well, he's going to pop it out. That'll be good. Now, everything here from the Civil War was from 1861. I know. Uh, let's have... Uh, scan this whole area with your uh, pinpointer again. Yeah, see if you can find it. Watch your shovel, though. I honestly think I saw it come out. Let's see. Why don't you look right over there? Now, do you see it? I know exactly what it is. <laughs> no. We're going to let you find it, though. Put that pinpointer back down on that ground again and look. Oh, right there. Oh. What is that? <laughs> what is that? That's a Civil War bullet, man. Hey, found a bullet. He found a bullet. <laughs> That's a good deal. I, I thought it was just like a 1861, bullet. somebody fired. Last time somebody fired that thing, they were trying to kill another human being. Most Imagine that. September the 10th, 1861. Isn't that crazy? You're touching history, man. <laughs> now let's go find you one. Come on. We always uh, cover our hole back up, and I kind of make it a. Uh, a that is great, Gage. To uh, make it to where even uh, James or uh, Corbett can't tell where I've been. If they can't tell where I dug a hole, I've done a good job. Yeah, because a lot of times we like to follow behind him and try to dig up stuff he misses. And, and that's good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, today I found a hole. You and ready? Inside it, there was a signal. <laughs> and it, uh, it ended up I there. have no idea where I should put this. Okay. Do you have pants pockets? Or I'll take, let okay. me show you what I do here. Let's now, go over this way. Let me show you a better way. Now let's step I over this. Good job, man. Congratulations. First big find, buddy. Not very many people go out on their first dig and find a Civil War artifact. It was my first find. Too. There you go. That's what I'm talking about, man. Let's go. So they was all shooting, shooting, went all over this place. I mean, bullets were flying through the air, knocking down the trees. It was crazy. Wait a minute, you hit something back here, Preston. Hold on. Yeah, you got a zinc signal back here. I'm gonna take my hand and see if I can uh, pull that apart a little bit. Don't reach in there and cut me. 
Ooh, it's right there. Ooh, there's something right there. Oh, it's right there. Probably something big. Now look at it again. Hit it with your pimp. What is that thing? See what that is. Oh, well, looky there. All right. See if there's anything else down there. I don't think there is, though. Well, maybe so, or something else down there. You guys find it? Not yet, let's see. Oh. Oh, it's that can, part yeah. of that can. Yeah. That's exactly that's what that is. Yeah, that's what it is. All right. There you go. Oh, well. Thank you for watching Digging History. We want to send out a special thank you to the West Virginia Library Commission for their support and access to books and historical articles that help us locate and bring history alive. Remember that some of the greatest adventures is just a short trip to your local library, and it's a tremendous resource that's free for us to use. We also want to thank the West Virginia Library TV Network and Beth Garrigal, our producer, who donates her time and energy to this project. In addition, we'd like to thank all of you great property owners and all of our friends, including Scott Smith, Chris Yeager. Uh, also, we'd like to thank, send a special thank you out to all of those that have been able to provide technical and material support to make this show a success. And our special guests, Byron Tucker, Clint Ridenauer, Jacob Kessling, and his son, Gage, and my children, Preston and Cassandra, who went digging with us and helped us find some awesome relics. I want to tell everyone to have an awesome day. And remember that a day digging history beats a day on the couch. So get to digging.